Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our PestFact Southern webinar. Uh, this webinar has been organised by the teams at um, the PestFact teams at Caesar and Sardi, and it's been made possible through the National Pest Information Service, which is a GRDC-funded project. Uh, my name is Julia Severi. I'm from Caesar. Uh, CESA is one of the delivery partners for the National Pest Information Service. Um, we operate in Victoria and southern New South Wales under the banner of PestFact Southeastern. I'm going to facilitate today's webinar. Um, it's mostly relevant to grains regions in southern and southeastern um, regions. Um, let me start today by uh, introducing our speakers and also our agenda for the day. So for our first talk, we've got Dr. Martin Van Halden. He's a senior entomologist at Saudi and the University of Melbourne. And we've also got, sorry, okay. University of Adelaide, sorry. <laughs> um, and do, also uh, Dr. Alia Purdle, who's an entomologist here at CESAR. Uh, they're going to be talking about uh, Russian wheat aphid uh, risk assessment and regional threshold project. Uh, next up, we've got our um, extension and communications lead here at CESAR, Dr. Jessica Lai. She's going to be talking about uh, resistance in green peach aphid and red-legged earth mite. And then last, we've got uh, Dr. Kim Perry. For, uh, he's a senior entomologist at Sardi, and he's going to talk about seasonal conditions and pest risk. Um, we've also got uh, Greg Baker here as well from, from Sardi, and he'll be um, joining Kim for question time. Before I hand it over to Martin, uh, just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, this is a, a live interactive webinar, so you can ask questions via the Q&A panel. Um, and there'll be two question times uh, where we'll uh, address the questions. Um, uh, but feel free to pop them in the, the Q&A box as they come to your head. Um, if, if we run out of time, we've got your email addresses so we can also get back to you about any questions that you've had. Um, and yes, this webinar is being recorded, so it'll be available for, for later viewing and um, we can dis distribute that link through our PestFax um, uh, mailing list. All right, so that's over to you, Martin, for your, to begin your talk. Thank you very much, Julia. We should be able to see that now. So I'll be talking about Russian wheat aphids for a short time and then uh, Ilya will take over because she's also doing a big part of this project. Um, so this will take about 10 minutes for me and 10 minutes for Ilya. Um, it would be nice if I could get the next slide. That's better. Okay, so Russian wheat aphid is an aphid that was first recorded in 2016 in Australia. Um, I think by now everybody knows what to look for in Russian wheat aphids, so this lime green long aphid without exhaust pipes. So I won't go into the details, but I put at least the slides in to make sure that everybody has seen that on the announcement of this seminar, it was not a Russian wheat aphid, but something else. I presume you've all seen that, so that's okay. Um, Russian wheat aphid was first discovered in South Australia, in Tali, and has expanded over the years. And this is the end of 2018 distribution as we know it. Um, so it is in the northern half of New South Wales at the moment. Um, we expect it to move on. Uh, there's some modeling that's being done that shows that it potentially can move into Queensland. Um, potentially it will also survive in Western Australia, but Western Australia so far has been um, protected by the Nullarbor Plains. So let's hope it stays that way for quite a while. But if it arrives there one day, it will certainly be able to survive in those environments. This is all available on a website that you can see, the RWA portal, uh, where you can see all these data. And actually, Elia will talk a little bit more about that too. This new GRDC project started last year. Um, it will run for two seasons. And the aim is to get a better understanding of how risky Russian wheat aphid actually is and to develop regional thresholds. So we're working on two growing seasons. Um, for the regional risk, we'll be looking into natural infestation trials, um, but also in a green bridge survey. And for the regional thresholds, we have no other choice than to do some inoculated trials on which I will extend a bit later on. So what do we know about Russian wheat aphid ecology? It's, it's an aphid that lives only on grasses. No other host plants are known. Um, and the risk that we have with Russian wheat aphids seems to be 
the early infestation. So if aphids come in early in the crop, they can survive over winter and then potentially build up in spring. Um, what we saw in 2016 was the problem paddocks where the Russian weed aphid was really present in large numbers were those where there was actually volunteer cereals. When the farmer did some direct drilling, sprayed out the volunteer cereals at the meantime, but that basically meant that the table was set with the new crop coming up for the aphids to switch over and that was causing problems. If you solve that issue, you probably have already solved quite a big risk for Russian wheat aphids. And we are looking at the moment in this project into two parts. First of all, bottom part of the screen, this green bridge, where do the aphids survive and how big are the numbers and do they pose a risk for the crops that go in in the coming season? And the second question mark on the right is, how do these aphids actually build up? Do they build up into damaging numbers? Um, we know they cause a lot of symptoms, but do they also cause yield loss? Because that's, of course, the risk for the farmer. Um, and that's a large part of this project. Um, last year, we did um, some trials. Uh, we had 15 trials going. Um, these trials were mostly natural infestation trials. So the 10 sites where we run those trials are shown on the screen. And we also did some inoculated trials in five different sites. In each of these trials, we have an untreated control. So we just put seeds in. We use a seed treatment with uh, imidacloprid, gaucho for most people. Um, and there's also a treatment using chlorpyrifos to spray out any aphids. And of course, in the inoculated trials, we then also add two more treatments, the untreated control with inoculation. So expecting high numbers of aphids and an inoculated area where we actually spray out the aphids later at growth stage, say 35, uh, using chlorpyrifos. So no seed treatment in there. Um, I'll show you the results that we have, even though we're still doing the analysis. And the results are quite interesting, I think, um, but need further work. Let's take a look at those results. So these are the field trial results from last year for the non-inoculated areas, so the natural infestation trials. And as you can see on the left top graph, um, in most of the sites we saw basically no aphids um, or very low numbers. Um, Birdship and Cummins, sorry, Griffith and Birdship were two exceptions. I'll come back to that in a few seconds. If you look below, we're looking at the actual number of tillers showing symptoms. And you can see that there's actually a few sites where there were a bit more symptoms, which were Keith, Loxton, and Riverton. And then um, just a little bit of symptoms in Hilston and Pianga. Now, the sites where we had aphids, the non-inoculated sites where we had aphids, and the also higher number of symptomatic tillers, that was actually a bit of an error in the experiment because these were the inoculated sites. So in an inoculated trial, we have at the same area, small plots with aphid inoculation and without inoculation. And unfortunately, as you can see in Birdship and Griffith, there was a bit of cross-contamination. There was also a bit of cross-contamination in Keith, Loxton, and Riverton, but it was much lower. So let's take a look at what actually happened in the inoculated trials, because that's much more interesting and much more impressive, I think. So it's the red bars that you can see. So this is artificial inoculation in Birdship, Griffith, Keith, Loxton, and Riverton. And as you can see, by putting up the same number of aphid in each trial, we get a very different development of aphids. We have really high populations building up in Griffith, Birdship, and a little bit in Luxton, but in Keith and Riverton, the aphid populations were not that big. And yeah, if you make the link between the red bars and the blue bars, you can immediately see that the bit of spillover explains the presence of the aphid in the non-inoculated parts of the trials in Birdship and Griffith. The aphid populations we got in these trials were really big. That's what we wanted, so it's not a big surprise, but I have to admit, we were a bit surprised by the big differences between the trial sites. On the lowest, Riverton, we had only 105 Russian weed aphids per 100 tillers, so that's not a very big population. Still impressive. Um, and in the percentage of tillers showing symptoms, it went from 30 to 75%. So visually, it was really a very important infestation that you could see in these trials. So 
that's symptoms and aphids. That is not the primary concern of the farmer. The farmer, of course, is worried about possible yield loss. So let me take a look at the actual yield in the different sites. Once again, it's a bit of a complicated, oops, a bit of a complicated slide. Um, in each trial, we had three different cereal commodities, usually barley, durum wheat, and wheat, in some cases oat. Um, and so I show you the three bars. In green, the non-inoculated, sorry, the inoculated, non-treated treatment. So that's where you would expect the highest numbers of aphids. We have the chlorpyrifis sprayed areas that were inoculated with aphids in blue, and we have the seed treatments in red. So as you can see here in Riverton, it's not that clear that there is a yield effect. Um, Riverton had 28% of tillers with symptoms, had 135 Russian wheat acres for 100 tillers. If you look at the bars, and if you also incorporate the standard deviation that is shown in the little black bars, um, this is probably not even a significant yield effect. So that was a bit of a surprise, but it was the lowest population. If you look at all the other sites, the images are slightly different. Well, are actually, in fact, very different. Um, and as you can see, if we go through the different sites, uh, especially at Griffith, there was a very strong effect of the aphid infestation. Saying that, Griffith was really in a bad year. Uh, we had very dry conditions and actually very low yield. Um, in spite of that, or maybe because of that, uh, the Russian wheat aphid had quite a high impact in Griffith, building up to extremely high numbers of aphids and basically causing a total yield loss in the untreated sites. Um, the chlorpyrifos for spraying seems to prevent yield loss quite efficiently, as did the seed treatment. Um, but yeah, Griffith was a very impressive trial to see. In all the other sites, the yield loss was not that clear, even though visually you might say the bars are a bit higher for the seed treatment. Statistically, and that's as a scientist we have to have confidence in, um, we don't see those huge differences. So to resume, we obtained purposely extremely high aphid numbers and symptoms. In spite of that, the yield loss was not as strong as expected, except maybe in Griffith. We had big differences between the sites. We had differences between the commodities, um, both in aphid numbers and tillers. There's still a lot of questions. The analysis is ongoing, but yeah, do keep in mind that we had at least 25% of tillers with symptoms and up to 75% in Griffith. What are we gonna do in this year? Well, we'll do more field trials. Um, we have a potential of 15 sites at the moment that we are still looking into. Uh, we'll have a few natural infestation trials in the northern part of New South Wales, where the aphid has been discovered only last year. All the inoculated trials will be done in the other sites, and that's sites where the aphid has been present for at least two years. Um, and at the moment we are discussing with our different subcontractors and the local agronomists and farmers to make sure that everybody is happy with doing these trials. And to be honest, I think it is important because we've seen that regional differences are so big that, yeah, we need to have a good impression of regional differences in risk. Um, rainfall gradients will probably play quite a strong role, um, both during season and before season or in between seasons. That's that famous green bridge. And for that, I'll give over to Ilya, who will cover that subject. Thanks, Martin. Bear with me. Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Aaliyah. Um, as Martin said at the start of his talk, there's two main questions that this project addresses. One being, how many aphids do you need to start seeing yield loss? Um, and the other, the other side of that is, what conditions allow aphids to reach those numbers in the first place? And that's the part of the project that I've been working mostly on, and that's green bridge surveillance. So what we're interested in is what are the conditions that allow aphids to be building up in the green bridge over the summer to large enough numbers where they're placed to move into crops um, when crops are young and vulnerable. 
And we expect this is going to vary quite a lot across the um, growing regions of Australia. You can see in those pictures down the bottom, the cereal regions of Australia cover a massive rainfall and climate gradient. Um, other local um, factors such as host plant composition, what sort of land usage is surrounding um, crops, and even what sort of beneficial populations are present, all of this could have a strong effect on where Russian wheat aphid are able to persist the summer and where they're not. And so to answer this question, as Martin said, it's really important to visit a whole lot of sites all across the, um, the gradient. And for that reason, we're visiting over 110 sites all across South Australia, New South Wales, Victoria, and Tasmania. And we're visiting those sites at several points in the season. We're going in the spring, we're going in the summer, and we're going in the autumn to see where aphid populations have built up and where they manage to persist and where they are moving into crops early in the following fall, autumn, excuse me. So I wanna show you our, we've done two rounds of this surveillance so far. We've been out um, last October for our spring round and we were out this last January for our peak summer round. And this right here, this map shows you what we saw in the spring. Everywhere you see a little red aphid means we did detect Russian wheat aphid and wherever you see a green one means we did not detect them. And the pattern in the spring was very much that Russian wheat aphid were distributed very widely and quite uniformly, especially in the drier northern regions of Victoria and New South Wales. Um, half of the points you see on that map are actually random roadside stops where we haven't particularly picked a crop or a, um, an irrigated or watered area to search. It's just any roadside and we were still finding Russian wheat aphid at a lot of those sites. But when we move forward into the summer, um, this is the July trip, you can see that, that populations, those populations have fallen quite dramatically. Um, though what is really important to note is while there are a lot less positive detections that we had in the summer, if you drew a circle around the overall range of Russian wheat aphid in the spring and you did the same thing in the summer, you can see that the range itself hasn't really died back. Um, there's little reservoirs all throughout um, that original range. And so that's what we're really interested in is those little reservoirs, what do they look like? What are the common conditions? And what's allowing um, these aphids to persist in those spots? One thing to note regarding what we saw in the spring um, was that there was some real dominant host grasses um, that, were, that Russian wheat aphid were favoring. And the winner of all the grasses really was barley grass. That was the one that Russian wheat aphid favored by far the most of the weeds. And that drove a lot of the distribution you see in that left-hand graph. And so just to show you, um, you can see the top, the top left pictures there are Russian wheat aphid colonies and barley grass. They really like hiding out in that flag leaf. Um, but we did see several other host plants that were favored, such as prairie grass and brome grass. Um, what we did notice that you can see in these pictures is the symptoms that um, I'm sure you've heard a lot about um, being obvious in wheat and barley crops, that, that striping is not very obvious in weeds is what we've been finding. They're quite subtle, which just means monitoring for aphids in the weeds really requires um, looking for the aphids themselves, not the symptoms. But what else was interesting is these favored weeds in the spring stayed the same favored weeds in the summer. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But what I'd like to do now is just show you some sites we visited that really give, um, that characterize the patterns we were seeing. So this first site, is a random roadside in New South Wales. Um, as I mentioned, we didn't choose to stop here, so it's quite far away from cereal crops. And already in the spring, as you can see, it was very dry. Um, and yet we did find Russian wheat aphid here. Um, and that bottom left picture you can see of a barley grass tiller. Um, that really shows the, the, the strong preference of barley grass for these aphids and the fact that they really managed to find their host plants anywhere that the host plants existed. Um, by summer though, this site had just dried out much too completely. This is an example of a site that, where we tended to see the largest Russian wheat aphid populations in the spring. And that's sites in drier areas. This was in New South Wales near Hay, um, where there was irrigation and where there was still some green growth, particularly new growth around crop edges. And we tended to see the largest Russian wheat aphid populations in that new growth around crop edges in the springtime, which you can see um, populations down there in the bottom left. But the interesting thing about this, it really kind of shows a trade-off that we saw. The sites where their populations grew really big in the spring, um, by summer, the sites were already far too dry um, and the aphids had died off as there was no host material left. And you can compare that to 
sites further south in higher rainfall areas, such as this site in Victoria, where somewhat surprisingly, um, we did not find as large or as uniformly spread Russian wheat aphid populations. And that was true in the summer as well. Um, this particular site, we didn't find them in the summer, but we found them at a site just down the road, but still a quite small population. And the same story is true in Tasmania as well, despite, as you can see in this picture, really abundant um, preferred weeds being available and crops being available, um, populations were much less uniform and somewhat smaller. Now, just to quickly show you where we did find them in the summer, so those few reservoirs that, that popped up on the map I showed before, because, as I mentioned, their host preference didn't change, their favorite hosts in the spring, barley grass and brome grasses, were still the favorite hosts in the summer, and those hosts don't do great in the summer. But the aphids weren't switching on to those more hardy summer grasses, like barnyard grass, which meant that really the only places they were persisting in the summer were places that were green enough for those less hardy grasses to persist. And we were finding that towns where there are watered areas, um, irrigated dairy pastures, um, higher rainfall regions such as Cowra in New South Wales, um, and some areas where regrowth allowed their more hardy preferred hosts to grow um, were the reservoirs that we were finding them. And so I guess to sum up, the overall picture we're seeing is this sort of fits our expectations from what we know about this pest overseas, but there is a trade-off between the best areas for the aphids to, to reach large population sizes are areas that are dry but still have green material in the spring and in the autumn, um, but then come summer those areas often get too dry, whereas the higher rainfall areas are never quite as suitable for the aphids in the spring and autumn, but they are allowed to still persist a bit better into the summer. We also saw that the preferred hosts were very consistent throughout, um, throughout the season, and that means you can really focus in on those preferred hosts when it comes to on-farm management. Barley grass really is the one to, to focus efforts on as far as um, clearing hosts prior to sowing. And finally, it's those reservoirs that have enough persistent water in the summer to keep weeds like barley grass, like florist grass growing, um, as well as summer rainfall to then let the aphids build up that right now appear to be um, the, the larger contributors to Russian wheat aphid persistence over the summer. And I'm just going to hand back to Martin for an overall conclusion about this project. Thank you, Ilya. Um, yeah, that, that basically sums it up um, quite well. So we think that the risk for Russian wheat aphid damage um, is occurring only in the lower rainfall areas when there is a wet summer. So that's pretty uncommon, unfortunately for the farmers. I presume they would have preferred a lot more rainfall over this summer. Um, but yeah, whether it was 2018 or this coming season, we're not expecting a lot of issues with Russian wheat aphids. It's just too dry. There's too little grasses surviving. Um, and, and we don't think there will be a problem with Russian wheat aphid in the coming year. Um, saying that, I have to admit, we've got only a few years of experience with this aphid. Um, we might have some surprises, but to be honest, I don't expect it. So farmers are, are really, should be, a, should be aware of these issues um, and have to ask themselves whether they should do a seed treatment. And we've seen that many farmers have adopted a seed treatment against Russian wheat aphids. In the dry years, it's certainly not necessary to do that. Um, even though, like I said, we still need more data to be sure about it. Um, we think that a fight strategy, so find the aphid, identify it, that's easy with Russian wheat aphids because it shows such clear symptoms. Um, user threshold, that's what we're trying to develop. I think the American thresholds are not that far off. Um, and then enact if needed, so do a spray if needed. And it seems very well feasible to avoid any yield loss if you would do an aphid spray in case of a heavy infestation around growth stage 32, 35, or 40, um, whenever it's compatible with other sprays that farmers would apply in these conditions at this time of the year. So not so big a problem as we thought this Russian wheat aphid. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, if you've got any questions, please type them in the um, question and answer box, the Q&A box there. Uh, we've got one for you, Martin. And that is, is there a difference in Russian wheat aphid susceptibility among varieties or are all weeds equally susceptible? Ah, that's a good question. Um, what we saw in the trials, where we had only a very limited um, 
variety range um, is that there seems to be a bit of difference. There's a clear difference between oats, which are not susceptible to Russian wheat aphid, and barley and wheat. Um, but it's difficult to say how, if there are big differences. We've done screening in the greenhouse looking at symptom development and all cereals show symptoms. Um, the question is, does that translate into yield loss? We've done only a very small trial this year. Um, and we were surprised by the big differences. Some of the varieties showed hardly any yield loss, even with heavy aphid pressure. And some of them showed a really spectacular yield loss. Um, it's not enough data for the moment to communicate about any of these differences, but I think there are differences between varieties, yes. And um, if growers are deciding to, to not use a seed treatment, um, how, how should they monitor for Russian wheat aphid? Oh, the monitoring for Russian wheat aphid is, is actually quite simple um, because this aphid shows those very clear symptoms. Um, if I can go back to my slides, see if that works. Um, took. Share. Am I on again? Yep. Yep. So let me see to go to the right slide. Um, there we are. So first of all, you have to spot symptoms, um, and that's very visible, these white stripes on the leaves. Um, all cereal varieties show similar symptoms. Um, durum wheat is probably the most beautiful symptom. Sorry for me saying that, but as an entomologist, I like it when the symptoms are clear. Um, you can then just do a count of the number of tillers that you have per square meter. So usually people do 50 centimeter row counts. Uh, count the number of tillers, count the number of tillers with symptoms, and then you still have to be, make sure that there are aphids inside those tillers with symptoms. So you can just take a few tillers, open them up, really unroll the leaves because the aphids are really inside the rolled leaves. And if you can do that, you can see how many tillers actually have aphids on them. Combining those two will give you a good indication about how many, um, how big a percentage of aphids have sorry, of tillers have aphids in your paddock, and that is the measurement that's used at the moment for the threshold. That's relatively simple and relatively reliable. Okay, great, thank you. Um, one more question, um, and I'll put it to either you, Martin, or you, Aaliyah. Um, what's the likelihood of Russian wheat aphid maintaining numbers over summer in towns and high rainfall areas, and then moving to low rainfall areas in spring and winter? Um, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, you happy for me to have a stab, Martin? Go ahead. Um, so I do think, so when you think about the ecology of Russian wheat aphid, they do have that life stage that's winged, which does mean that they're going to be able to spread out of these reservoir pockets. Um, what we don't know right now is how long that takes them. So that's why the next round of surveys is going to be very interesting, because we've identified some of those pockets, such as towns, um, pastures, and what we really want to know is how quickly they build up in those areas and move out. So far we've seen that they're not really building up in those areas, even though there's kind of abundant um, hosts available in some of those areas, their population numbers are still very small and that could just be temperature um, being too high for them. But it could be the case that the closer you are to these areas just puts you at a higher risk of seeing the effects of Russian wheat aphids earlier on um, towards crop emergence. Um, but I think we're gonna have a lot uh, more insight once we go out this following autumn um, and see how the, the spread is progressing. Um, but Martin, if you had any other thoughts to add? No, I just, yeah, we, we've seen quite high aphid populations at the very beginning of last season. I remember that I was in Tasmania to set up a trial and there was volunteer cereals around the trial and they were full of aphids. Mm. Um, so that was good for us because we hoped we would get aphids in the trial. Excuse it again to the farmers. Um, but they never moved in. So. An aphid, especially this very small Russian wheat aphid, is a, is a clumsy flyer. To, to actually decide to go and fly and hope to find a new host plant is, is risky business. So aphids need to have a good reason to start flying, uh, which probably is by the time their host plant dies off. In a very wet situation like you might have in Tasmania, there probably will not be a real die off of those plants. So the aphids might just stay there and decide not to move. 
thanks so much, Martin and Aaliyah. That's great. Um, if you do have any more questions coming through from the audience, just please type them in. Um, but if we don't get them, get to them today, um, yeah, we, we will get back to you. Okay, so I'm just going to take over screen sharing here. We're going to pass it over to Jessica Lai. Thanks, Julia. Okay, so we're going to stick with aphids for the minute, but now we're going to move on to green peach aphid. So this is a pest that's found in many countries around the world. Uh, it has a very, very broad host range. Um, and this discussion today is going to focus on insecticide resistance. And the fact that it has a broad host range is quite notable. Um, this pest in grains will um, definitely affect canola, but it will also affect many horticultural crops as well, which of course is going to increase um, selection pressure when there are um, sprays being applied by, um, by across industries and that's something to consider in regards to insecticide resistance management. Um, one reason why green peach aphid is a, an aphid that um, it, that is important to consider in terms of management early in the season is it's it's a prolific vector of viruses and particularly uh, turnip yellows virus. So this was formerly known as beet western yellows virus. So um, it also has a, a very strong propensity, uh, the aphid, to develop insecticide resistance and worldwide it's developed resistance to over 70 um, actives, which is quite a few. Because aphids reproduce asexually, it means that their populations can increase very quickly. So if a population does uh, develop uh, resistance, which is developed, of course, on the genetic level, uh, those resistant aphids can proliferate very quickly and potentially spread to other regions. Um, it's an aphid that, um, in terms of migration, it's heavily influenced by, um, by temperature and, um, and also rainfall, and I'll speak a little bit about that shortly. So in terms of insecticide resistance, CESA's been doing a bit of work in this um, space on GPA over the last few years. Um, it's particularly important for the grains industry in Australia because insecticides um, available for use for green peach aphid control are very few. So we have our synthetic pyre pyrethroids, carbamates, organophosphates, neonicotinoids, and more recently we've gained access to sulfloxaflor. So in 2012 and 13, we started doing some um, uh, assays to look at um, detecting resistance to uh, pyrethroids around Australia. And as you can see, there was um, some resistance detected, denoted by the red dots in WA, a little bit in Queensland, a bit in SA and also in, in Victoria. But if you compare that to the map on the right, which shows more recent results from 2017 and 18, Definitely the, um, the detection of resistance, uh, the occurrence has increased quite a bit, as you can see from the map and the spread of those red, red dots. So if we have a look at carbamate resistance, it shows a very similar trend. Um, some resistance detected in 2012-13 and definitely more resistance detected more, more recently in 2017 to 18. Um, so what that means is um, essentially the, those uh, actives, so insecticides that fall into the group of syn synthetic pyrethroids and carbamates, um, so your alpha cypermethrin, your bifenthrin, um, those uh, GPA is going to um, generally carry resistance to those insecticides. We're picking it up in about 99% of populations that are tested. So we've also been looking at resistance to organophosphates. You can see by the map, we were just starting to pick up resistance uh, a few years ago. And now you can see that resistance to organophosphates is very, very widespread throughout Australia. So in 2012 and 13, we weren't picking up resistance to neonics. However, more recently, um, about three or four years ago, we started picking up um, via bioassays. Um, there started to be an indication that we have uh, resistance in Australia uh, to emitted clot bridge. And as you can see from the more recent um, map showing uh, from 2017, 2018, uh, we now have um, issues with neonicotinoid resistance um, throughout Australia. 
So one thing I will mention is there are different kinds of resistance. So the resistance that we get for your synthetic pyrethroids and carbamates, uh, what we call target site resistance. So this is um, generally sort of an on off switch resistance. If you have a population of aphid that has this target site resistance, if they, if they carry that, um, then no matter how much chemical you use, it's, it's not going to be effective. The other kind that we find for neonicotinoid resistance and organophosphate resistance is metabolic resistance, which is a bit different. Here are some dose response curves um, that we ran. This, um, these assays generally give us an, an idea of the magnitude of resistance that we're dealing with. So on the left, you can see that we've tested um, the responses of susceptible GPA populations to alpha, alpha cypermethrin, um, and those susceptible populations are denoted by the black dots. And then we had also tested a resistant population also denoted by the white circles. So you can see by the black dots, as you approach your field rate, you are getting control. However, um, as you approach the field rate, um, when testing the resistant population, um, and the field rate is denoted by the red dash, uh, we, we don't get control at all. And this is reflected by um, testing of populations that carry uh, target site mutations for uh, carbamates. In this case, we were testing perimicarb. So we had also run some um, dose response curb, curves for agonophosphates. Um, and in this case, you can see that um, you do eventually gain some level of control um, once you pass the field rate. But the curve in this case is, a, is, is quite shallow. Um, and you can see here quite clearly the difference between target site resistance and metabolic resistance. Um, you may get control at some stage, um, but, but you definitely absolutely need to um, use chemistry at, at the field rate um, as per the label. And in case of neonicotinoid resistance on the right here, you can see that that curve um, is very is similar to the organophosphate um, curve. Um, it's, it's a shallow curve and eventually as you approach the field rate you will get control but below that field rate um, control is variable. So this really shows that using the field rate, um, correct nozzles, making sure your equipment is, is working properly is extremely important. So as I mentioned at the start of the talk, it's obviously really important to um, have a think about your risk of um, green peach aphid, particularly in the context of, of virus risk as well. So studies have shown that um, early infection of turnip yellows virus can cause uh, yield losses up to um, 40, 47%. And in the um, 2014 epidemic a few years ago, yield losses of up to 75% in canola were found, which is quite high. However, you will get uh, reductions in the, um, the risk of yield loss uh, the later that infection occurs, particularly if it occurs after the rosette stage. So it's important to remember that um, some plants can act as reservoirs for green peach aphid, much like Russian wheat aphid has reservoirs in, in certain grasses. Um, so your spring, spring sown uh, canola that's surviving throughout the summer period could potentially be a reservoir for, for virus. So you, need, you do need to keep that in mind. Um, in terms of virus risk, there also do need to be favourable conditions for green peach aphid to um, fly and migrate, um, so winged aphids to migrate to new areas, but also if, um, if you have local green peach aphid, even if they're wingless in the area, they still have the potential to, um, to migrate you know, a little way and, and walk um, from, from weedy, weedy hosts that they might be surviving on into, into your paddock. So in terms of when green peach aphid migrate, there is a little bit of data um, indicating that your main times for migration of winged aphids will be um, in your early autumn period as well as your spring period. Uh, it's when uh, temperatures start dropping and you get those milder temperatures between 18 and 24 degrees as well as um, a bit of rain. They tend to be the um, ideal conditions for green peach aphid flight. So in terms of green peach aphid control, um, just a few tips to remember going into the season. So um, when uh, green peach aphid 
uh, migrate, when the, the winged aphids migrate, um, they generally uh, start developing wings if the um, host they're feeding on at the time started, starts to lose nutrition or population numbers become too dense. They will fly and they'll fly very high um, and they will start to look for areas to land. So if you sow into standing stubble, that reduces the contrast between seedlings and um, bare earth. And it is that contrast that these migrating aphids are looking for um, in order to give them a cue to land. So they, they won't have that cue um, to land in your paddock. So if possible, sow into standing, standing stubble. Make sure you're able to identify green peach aphid. So this aphid, um, you can put out sticky traps, although it can be hard to ID an aphid when it's sort of smooshed on a, on a sticky trap. So you might find doing a walk through your paddock and a visual survey works best with a hand lens. Just remember, they tend to hang out lower in the canopy, particularly on the, the older leaves. So keep that in mind when trying to ID them. And if in doubt about an ID, um, certainly contact your local pest fact service. So pest fact South Australia or pest fact South Eastern to help with an identification. Beneficial populations are something to keep in mind later in the season, particularly around spring. You'll find that you might start seeing aphid mummies around the place, which indicates that some parasitoid wasps have, have found the, the population and are helping with control. And then generalist uh, predators like your ladybird beetles and your hoverflies might be around as well. And absolutely avoid repeating applica repeated applications of the same mode of action um, when controlling green peach aphids. So make sure that you check the label um, to find out exactly what mode of action you're using and look up the resistance management strategy for green peach aphid on the IPM um, guidelines for grains website or the GRDC website. How are we going for time? A bit over, but it's okay. Okay, I'll, I'll wrap up. Just I want to leave you with a note about um, red-legged earth mite. So here's a life history, um, life cycle of red-legged earth mite. As you can see up the top, um, we're approaching or in that zone where red-legged earth mite are starting to come out of diapause, temperatures are dropping, um, um, hopefully we'll get a little bit wetter, wetter soon. Um, so you might start to see your red-legged earth mite around. So the current range of red-legged earth mite is shown by the gray dots on this map. So something to note about resistance in red-legged earth mite, um, WA have been dealing with um, resistance um, for, for many years, but only recently has resistance um, to um, synthetic pyrethroids in red-legged earth mite been found in South Australia. And again, um, similar situation to GPA, we have few, few mode of actions available to us in order to um, help with control of, of red-legged earth mite. Although, more recently, there has been an extension of label um, for Pegasus um, for control in canola. So here is a map showing um, what we've found. We've detected um, resistance to synthetic pyrethroids um, in South Australia more recently. And there are also indications of resistance to um, OPs in South Australia as well. So um, that is your current status of um, insecticide resistance in red legs. Um, if you want more of an overview, uh, you can download the res um, resistance management strategy for red legs again from either GRDC website or um, IPM guidelines for grain. So it's important to download that document and have a really good um, look. It'll give you great guidelines on um, chemistries you can use and, and risks and cultural controls that you can use for management of red legs too. And I'll leave it there. Thanks so much, Jess. Um, we'll hold off um, from addressing questions now, but if you do have any, please send them through. Um, and we'll go to Kim Perry over at Sardi. Great. See you, Kim. Great. Hi, all. So we've had a really good coverage of the issues around Russian wheat aphid and green peach aphid and the fact that we, you know, clearly insecticide resistance is evolving and there are now um, insecticide resistance management plans that have been developed to try and uh, curb resistance. So clearly rotating mod modes of action chemi chemistry is really important but another really important component to that is whether or not we need to be using these products in the first place and, you know, given that we need to be making a lot of these decisions before crops go in, in many cases, and before we've got a chance to assess whether the pest is present, 
uh, we have to use some other clues to try and uh, get a handle on season, seasonal resistance. Uh, sorry, seasonal risk. So Martin, can you go to the next slide? So as Jess mentioned, there are um, there is a resistance management plan available for the green peach aphid. A key point is that we're really down to one effective chemistry that we know uh, we haven't had resistance detected to as yet, and that is sulfoxiflor or transform. So clearly we need to be looking after that uh, particular chemistry. Um, you know, thinking back to 2014, one of the issue, issues we had was that due to resistance, growers weren't actually able to get any sort of control of green peach aphid. So I, I really want to talk about assessing seasonal risk. And Martin, can you move the, move, move the slides on? And again. All right, so many of us have uh, nasty memories of that outbreak of uh, green peach aphid in 2014. Next slide, Martin. And when we look back, there were some clear uh, climatic conditions that led to that particular outbreak. So on the top line of panels here, we have the monthly rainfall anomalies. And on the bottom panels, we have the mean temperature anomalies for each month. And Martin, just press the button. What we can see is that we had very good, and I'm sorry these maps only relate to South Australia. Uh, the other maps in subsequent slides will include Southeastern Australia. But at least in SA, uh, we had very good February and April rainfall, well above average, which really kicked that green bridge along and allowed both the aphid and the virus to build up. And then in May, we had very warm conditions, something like two to three degrees above average. And what that did was really accelerated aphid development and uh, promoted migration. And we had green peach aphid flying into crops very early in the season and transmitting virus. Uh, to canola crops. Next slide, Martin. So in that sense, 2014 is an excellent benchmark for a high risk year and we can start looking at how you know, this season and last season conditions compared, at least in, in South Australia and in many parts of Victoria, we had very, very low populations of Russian wheat aphid last year. And again, looking back at the seasonal conditions that we experienced, they were very, very dry during that pre-cropping period. And looking at these uh, rainfall maps, we could have predicted that was going to occur. So many people used uh, seed treatments last year on their cereals, um, but looking back, that was probably one year where that may not have been uh, needed. In fact, almost certainly not. Next slide, Martin. So how are we tracking this year? Uh, back a slide, Martin. Thank you. How are we tracking this year? Again, February, February and March have both been very, very dry across large areas of south southeastern Australia. Um, so it's looking very much like a, a another low risk year. Next slide, Martin. And just to explain some related work that we've been doing on a different insect. Um, during the last, well, since 20, 2014, we've been doing some, some work on the diamondback moth and the host plants that support that particular insect between growing seasons and looking very closely at the green bridge and how it can vary across seasons. So this represents a series of photographs taken at the same location at the same time of the year and clearly highlights the differences in the green bridge that can occur. And even though this is only one location, clearly, uh, we did find that the, uh, the dynamics of the insect in crops very much matched what we saw during our Greenbridge surveys. And again, we can see how dry it's looking, at least at this location in March 2019. Next slide, Martin. So what does this mean around insecticide decisions? Well, I guess if we're assessing risk and using that as a guide, uh, this would be one year where you could potentially afford to go easy on your pesticide early in the season. So we've developed or come up with some guidelines to help you make some decisions, at least around green peach aphid and virus. And clearly for that insect, um, the issue is that virus can often be transmitted before you've really had a chance to detect that the aphid is present. 
And so, again, thinking about the seasonal risk is very important. I will just make one point. Uh, insecticides don't directly control the virus. What we're controlling is the aphid that carries the virus. So um, it's not like a, you know, it's not like a fungicide in that sense. So in high risk situation, certainly seed treatments are a fantastic uh, tool that we can use and sowing into standing stubble as Jess recommended. When would you consider spraying with, uh, let's say, transform? If you certainly needed to get good control, when would you do it? Well, virus spreads around the landscape when the aphid transmits or picks up the virus from infected plants and then moves to uninfected plants. So if you have a mix of infected and uninfected crop areas, that's when you might consider treating those areas. Um, you would have to make sure, of course, that you had aphids present and the conditions were conducive for them to be moving around. Otherwise, your pesticides are simply not going to have any benefit at all. And also, we know that most of the yield impact that comes from virus transmission happens when virus is transmitted very early in the season, uh, pretty much right up to the rosette stage. So in that scenario, uh, you might consider a pesticide treatment. When wouldn't, you tre when wouldn't you treat? If you had absolutely no aphids and it was a very low seasonal risk, you certainly wouldn't. As we get into winter and conditions cool down, uh, certainly June, July, uh, aphids simply will not move around at all. And e even if you happen to have some in infect infected aphids in your crop, uh, there's still a very, very low likelihood of any sort of spread. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't get the benefit out of spraying at that point. And clearly, as you go later into the crop cycle, the uh, potential yield benefits of doing so decline drastically as well. So we hope those guidelines are somewhat helpful. Next slide, Martin. Uh, one issue that came up last year was uh, around identification. Um, people were seeing green aphids in their crops at certain points. We know we have uh, three canola aphids that are very common, cabbage aphid, turnip aphid, and green peach aphid. Um, cabbage aphid is very waxy, uh, and so is turnip aphid to some extent, whereas green peach aphid does tend to be a, you know, a brighter colour. Uh, but through aphid culturing, we noticed that some of those cabbage aphids can actually look very uh, very green in colour when they initially molt. So they may not be green peach aphid. The second point I want to make is that should you be concerned if you see some green peach aphid in your crop? And I would say generally no. Um, this insect is there every year. Uh, just because you have aphids doesn't mean you're going to have an issue with virus. When we look back at 2014, a lot of different factors combined to make that a, uh, an outbreak year. But you know, green peach aphid is just a, a normal pest that's always present in the landscape. Next slide, Martin. Uh, there are some clear ways you can distinguish green peach aphid. Um, again, you can contact us, as Jess mentioned. But one of the key ones I'll point out is the top of the head has these um, structures called tubercles. If they point inwards, then they're green peach aphid. And you can often have a look and see those with your hand lens. Next slide, Martin. And we'll skip that slide. Just move it along. Thanks. We'll skip that slide too. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll leave it there. But really, the two key points are we need to be using our pesticides only when required to look after them and always assess risk before making a decision. And we can use some of those weather patterns as very strong clues. Thanks a lot. Great, thanks Kim. Um, if you've got any questions from the audience um, for, for Kim or for Jess, please send them through. Um, there is a couple coming through for Jess. Um, what are the thresholds for red-legged earth mite? Uh, so there are some thresholds available for red-legged earth mite um, and the pest note online for red-legged earth mite has been um, updated recently, so I won't go through the exact thresholds because um, there are different thresholds depending on the crop. But what you can do is navigate navigate to the pest note on um, the CESA website or on the SARDI website and check those thresholds on there. So they're certainly available. And another one, um, at what growth stage can Pegasus be applied? 
Um, so you can you can apply Pegasus at the cotyledon stage. Um, just one thing to be aware of with Pegasus, the withholding period is quite long. It's 11 weeks. So just keep that in mind if um, you're considering use of that. More question coming through. Um, what is the risk of metabolic resistances evolving into target site resistance? Um, uh, look, resistance, it, it, it evolves um, sporadically. So it can be really difficult to um, determine whether, you know, you have a risk of metabolic resistance or target res site resistance evolving. Certainly, target site resistance can be um, definitely um, the more severe, um, although metabolic um, resistance can be obviously very, um, very damaging too. Um, but I guess the take home is if you're applying insecticides quite frequently, um, particularly of the same active group, then you're going to have constant selection pressure on a population of, um, of pests in your, on your paddock and, and that's going to increase the risk of resistance evolving. Thanks. Um, looks like that's all the questions that have come through. Uh, if you do have any questions after the webinar, um, you can send it through. I'll put our email up now. So you can send any um, further questions that you have um, through me uh, at pestfax at caesaraustralia.com. Um, I'll make sure that they get to the right person for answering. Um, if no one else has any more questions, um, just want to say a big thank you to all our presenters today. That was very insightful. And also a big thank you to you, the audience, for joining us today and for participating. Um, yes, and any more questions, just send them through. Um, but if not, we'll leave it there for now. Thanks so much. Bye.